friends, welcome to the Three Pillars podcast with your host Griselda Barreto. Aviation. Today's guest is Mary Rose Ness. Mary Rose did her initial training 19 years ago at the Sabena Flight Academy and soon after graduation she started working as a flight attendant on medium haul and long haul aircraft. She was promoted to Bursa almost 13 years ago. As from her initial training, she has flown on the Avro, the 146, ATR-72-8, the Boeing 737, the Airbus 320 and the Airbus 330 family too. She is passionate about her job and still, after all this time, she really loves flying. But now she is even more passionate about promoting healthy flight conditions and solutions. After finding out about the dangers of contaminated air in aircraft and the impact of toxic fumes on the human body, she started an awareness campaign on her own in the company she is presently flying for. Now looking back in time, the first results and evolution are encouraging. However, she realizes that there is still a long way to go. Hi Rose, welcome to The Three Pillars. I'm so glad you could make it on our show. How are you doing? I'm doing great and happy uh, to be here. Oh, that's great. Um, Rose, before we begin, can I ask you to give a little description about yourself to our listeners? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I started my journey in aviation uh, about uh, 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, uh, when I started at uh, a flight academy in my country and uh, where I was trained immediately on the Boeing 737 and the uh, Airbus 320. And then uh, immediately after my graduation, I signed a contract with uh, a company where I was trained on the Avro 146 uh, family um, and also on the propellers uh, ATR 72 and on the Dash 8. And after a few years of flying, I became a purser and I'm still flying uh, part-time for the moment. So that's a little bit, uh, that's a short version of my bio. <laughs> okay. And do you love flying? I really do love flying. It's a wonderful job. Um, it is like every girl's dream when you're uh, little, uh, mm -hmm. but still, um, when I go flying, I still love my job every day. Yes. Yeah, that's great. So, uh, could you take us on this journey that you've had with the aerotoxic syndrome? Can you tell us how it all started for you, how you discovered it? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I was experiencing, uh, physical problems actually, and um, I met Dr. Michelle Mulder at a retreat, which I was doing uh, just for my personal uh, development. And uh, I was introduced to him and uh, he told me that he was he had been flying for uh, a long time with uh, KLM and um, and he became ill. So he, he introduced me into the aerotoxic syndrome and I, I actually, I'd never heard about that uh, uh, syndrome. So he introduced me into the symptoms and then I must say that it was like a puzzle uh, that all the pieces of the puzzle came together and I understood like, okay, this, this could uh, explain all these physical uh, symptoms that I experienced. And well, at the time we were there for a week long retreat and he sent me some um, research papers, uh, some documentary to see on, on YouTube and uh, uh, so many information. So every night when we were in, in our rooms, uh, I was reading all these materials and I was actually very surprised. So I asked Dr. Mulder, like, why? Why is, is this something that is happening in my company as well? And 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 if so, why why don't I know this? I, at the time, I was flying already seventeen years, and I never heard about that uh, aerotoxic syndrome. And then he asked me the question, like, why do you think so? Mm -hmm. So I only could say at the moment, at at the time there, um, like, well, it seems like they don't want us to know actually. And then he said, yes. Bingo. <laughs> and then one of the questions I asked, okay, are there some solu solutions then? And he said, well, it depends on the aircraft, but for the moment, 
there are some solutions, but they will they will not uh, solve the problem 100%. But there are solutions. So I asked him the question, so why don't they, it, for me, it was easy just invest in the solutions. And then he asked me the question again, why do you think they don't invest? And I thought, well, I don't know. Is it a matter of money? And he said, bingo. And then uh, the last question I asked him, okay, what, what, what can I do now to have my own physical health, to improve my own physical health? And his first uh, reaction was, well, stop flying. But that wasn't an option at the time. So I started to inform myself even on a deeper level. And now I could actually go to my doctor and say, like, I think it is this and that, that I have this aerotoxic syndrome. And how can we go from there? But then at the same retreat, I asked Dr. Mulder, like, could you do something like a presentation? And he said, I could. <laughs> and I asked him, okay, so uh, would you willing to? I said, yes, I would, I would be willing to. And he said, well, if you're going to organize this just remember that this could be the start of the end of your career in aviation but at the time in in that week retreat i was so shocked actually that's the word i was completely shocked about mm. that this information was withhold, withheld from us and mm. that this that aerotoxic syndrome was caused by toxic fumes due to the bleed there and and so on yeah. and i i so i contacted a lot of colleagues uh, in that week. And I called them and I asked them, like, have you ever heard about aerotoxic syndrome? And all of them said, no. I said, well, isn't that amazing? We are flying for 15 to 70 to 20 years and nobody heard about it. And then I contacted somebody of the union mm -hmm. in our company and I asked her, like, did you ever heard about fume events and aerotoxic syndrome? And she said, yes. And I said, really? well, how is it possible that we have never heard about this? And she said, well, you know, when there are uh, reported uh, fume events, uh, this is something that is completely ignored. So I was even more shocked when, when I heard that. I'm sorry. So it means that um, the airline company is aware that it exists. Yes, absolutely. Yes, they were 100% aware of the problem. Mm -hmm. That was really, wow, that was such an eye-opener and I couldn't believe actually. It was, again, a shock. So I, I asked the lady of the union, I want to organize a, an information presentation on the topic and I want to invite Dr. Mulder to give this presentation so my colleagues at least are aware. I, I had to collect all my courage and, and as a human being, I, I felt this duty that with the information I received, I couldn't go on living just like nothing happened and, and mm -hmm. not informing my colleagues. It's, it was like something deep in, inside said, well, you have to do something with it uh, mm -hmm. because otherwise you're neglecting and you're uh, the problem as well. So in that week, the last day of that week, I found a conference room. I set the date <laughs> and uh, Dr. Mulder was really surprised. He said, wow, you're, uh, you're somebody who takes action. I said, yeah. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I, I, instead of being shocked and taking, because at the time also I was a little bit angry at information and, and knowing that my company knew this and didn't do anything to inform us, seeing all these uh, papers from, for example, I, I received also a leaflet from British Aerospace, which was sent to the company companies in the year 2000 and I was speaking discovering aerotoxic in 2017 mm -hmm. so that was 17 years later then this leaflet was sent to all the airline companies who used the Avro. What did the leaflet say? Well the leaflet was uh, some kind of a protocol what to do in case of uh, cabin air contamination what the causes could be what the in case of contamination what the action steps had to be and on, on page 11 was a whole set of protocol on the medical uh, side on the where a crew had to take blood samples uh, urine samples had to note down all the physical symptoms they experienced on the flight or during a certain time after a fume event but this information never reached us as cabin crew so again all mm. the more i discovered the more information i got because this is a real official document uh, from yeah. british aerospace the more i felt that i couldn't do nothing with it i had to 
it, and, and it was not only for myself, for my own health, but it was mm -hmm. as part of a community, you know, uh, you have been flying yourself and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the community, the team awareness, we, we are actually like a one big happy family. And uh, the, the colleagues I know became also friends. Like, so I didn't even think about the risks about even losing my job. I just yeah. did it. I started my awareness campaign in the company. Yes. Mm. I always, I was speaking to somebody else, another pilot uh, a couple of days ago, and mm. I was telling him, this is so awful, you know, because the aviation, the job is such a positive job. Crew are always trained to be well-groomed, to be smiling all the time. They teach us on customer service and customer care. And we are very happy generally, you know, you, that's how we are. We get used to being with a smiling face all through mm -hmm. our duty time and you know when we're on the aircraft but mm -hmm. the worst part is behind it all there's something so dark and so hidden mm -hmm. that it, it becomes a bit done on purpose there's something sinister happening in the background yet we you know everybody flies because they love flying sure. you love the job and then yeah. you have your company that's hiding things from you probably and they mm -hmm. know that your health might be affected by it but they're not doing anything about it um so yeah that's that's really shocking to a certain mm -hmm. extent Yes, it, it at the time and now, okay, you get used to to that reality. So uh, the shock made place for courage and also like a vision that mm. I held a vision of change. Happily, I'm very positive minded. I have a positive mindset. And yeah. I, I started the awareness campaign and I was, of course, I asked, first of all, the, the help of the company. Let's, I, I, I addressed myself to my management and said, you know, that's the date I'm going to organize an information concerning aerotoxic syndrome. And their first uh, reaction was, we don't uh, do propaganda. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh, really? So I told one of the, the management, uh, the people of the management, I said, you know, you know, I, I'm not going to use any names, but I, I told one of them, like, you know, there are some people here home after a fume event. Because between the time of the end of the retreat, where I met Dr. Mulder and the announcement that I made in the company, there were two, three or four weeks in between. So I started to inform myself and people started to talk like, yes, I experienced wet, wet socks and I experienced a fume event. So soon, very soon, a lot of testimonials came in my direction. And mm. I was like, really? Is it that often? I was so, I, I fell from one surprise into another. And so I told a lady of the management, like, you know that here are people home after a fume event. You know that. And then she said, yeah, yeah, she, she nodded. She didn't say anything. And then she said, well, you know, you can uh, put your flyers if you want to do it. It's very noble of you, but you can put your flyers <laughs> in the cruise center. So I did. I made flyers. I, I hang posters and the flyers always disappeared. I put it on the table and one day or the other, they, they disappeared all away. So <laughs> I knew I was like uh, sabotaged. Mm. But yeah. then one of my colleagues said, why don't you use social media? And I said, wow, really? Indeed. I, I didn't think about that idea. So I opened a group and I had this crew for a healthy uh, non-toxic cabin air. Mm. And in about one week, we had almost 2,000 members because wow. all crew members were adding people to the group, inviting people to the group. So that went well. So at first, the management didn't take me seriously. And they it's not that they were laughing, but they were not uh, very cooperative. They really thought that my little action, as they said it, wouldn't reach a lot of people. But mm. then that, at the end of that week, when they saw uh, my group growing, they called me like, well, you have to stop this because you are on the uh, social media and your contract says you cannot use social media and uh, you cannot uh, use uh, the press. I, I just said, you know, I'm not posting any uh, specific information concerning companies. So that was uh, that was the start of a of a of an adventure, so to speak. <laughs> Now things are changing in the company. I could, uh, the, the awareness campaign did its work. Everybody have heard now about our toxic syndrome and cabin air uh, quality events or fume events or smell events. There are so many names for the same toxic fumes. So the first goal I had so many goals, but the first goal is already reached. And we are talking now in the time span of less than a year. 
Wow, that's great. So you've done a lot, Rose. Congratulations. That's great for the community, uh, for victims, survivors out there. It's really amazing what you've done. Uh, okay. Can I go a bit more personal and ask you, what were the symptoms that you were showing? And at which point, you know, you actually understood that what you had was related to aerotoxic syndrome? Mm -hmm. Well, I experienced a lot of headaches all the time, and that was not not something common for me. Uh, at a certain point, I started to have these headaches, tingling in my fingers, which I sometimes I still have. I started to experience uh, problems with my adrenal gland, with my thyroid, uh, my short-term memory was affected. Uh, I couldn't remember some things. And, and even though we are drilled, really drilled uh, year after year in, in the same procedures, there were moments uh, that I really had to think about routine tasks. And that's something I, I thought that was very strange for me because I'm I think I'm very aware of, uh, I have a very good situational awareness. And there were times I didn't know, like arming the doors, like I really had to think about normal daily procedures. So these were the symptoms. And when I, I really called to me was while I was talking with uh, Dr. Mulder. So uh, uh, during that retreat and, and when I was talking with him and reading into the materials, uh, seeing all these documentaries, it occurred to me like, oh my God, I am being poisoned. Oh my mm. God. And th that's, that was a very scary moment. And that's why I... I started this campaign because I want I want change and there are technical solutions to lower the risk of toxic fumes and I just want to well stimulate uh, uh, companies to invest in these solutions but it's going to going to cost them some money and I think it's their duty to invest to safeguard our health and uh, I will do everything within my means to do that because I like my job. I want to to fly, uh, but by myself, there are thousands and thousands of cabin crew and pilots flying. We are talking about crew now, but there are also passengers flying all the time. So all these passengers have to be protected as well. And we are talking about millions and millions of people. It's not only the crews and, and pilots, but everyone is actually affected yeah yeah so did you go to your doctor and what did they advise what did they find well when i got this information i went to i don't know actually the name in english orthomolecular yeah orthomolecular uh, yeah okay uh, doctor and uh so i told him about uh, that i was flying and about this information and he actually said i have a lot of people from aviation in my portfolio and uh, then he took uh, a lot of blood samples he investigated uh, exactly the blood uh, and they found heavy uh, metals in my blood and he started like a detox treatment on a high level so I had about 10 infusions I also took cortisol to uh, help my thyroid and to help my uh, adrenal glands and I took a lot of supplements I'm st still taking them so I am still taking supplements every day to detox my body especially when I'm go go flying I fly now a part time. It's only seven days a month, uh, approximately. So that's that's good. But uh, actually, no doctor ever heard about aerotoxic syndrome. So I had to explain him, and I had to send him all these uh, studies and research papers. I had a good doctor helping me into this into this matter. But also, his advice was: please stop flying. Because if you will be exposed even more to these toxic chemicals, even though if you are uh, uh, doing like a detox treatment to get all these materials out of your system, as long as you are adding to the system, adding uh, toxic chemicals to the system, there will be one day that it will be, it's one drop too much. And then the effects are for the rest of your life. If I'm brutally honest, I'm afraid to go flying to experience a, a fume event because I know in my company there are a lot of fume events nowadays. Old um, aircrafts uh, in a low cost environment. Yeah. So that's that's my personal that was my personal treatment and, and I still have to take care very well of my body. Mm. Tell us about because I, I remember you spoke once to me about 
certain goals that you envision uh, for your struggle with aerotoxic syndrome and for bettering the situation for the entire aviation community and passengers. So tell us about these goals that you have in mind. Mm -hmm. So the first goal I had uh, in, in my company, but also worldwide, is an awareness campaign. Because if nobody knows about the problem, so they can't know what the signals are, uh, like the, the wet uh, dog, uh, smelly socks, uh, chemical odors, what they are, and also the symptoms that uh, people will experience immediately when exposed to these toxic chemicals. So first of all, the first goal I had in within my company, because I could only work within my company where I'm flying is uh, to start an awareness uh, campaign. And uh, now in my company, uh, everybody knows about uh, aerotoxic, everybody knows about cabin air quality events. So that goal is reached. But if, you, if, we, if we open it up worldwide, then there's still a lot of work to do on that goal, like awareness for the passengers also. I think that's something we have to do. A lot of people will have to do together. That's not something I can do on my own. So the second goal, what I found uh, important was to change the highly toxic uh, mobile jet 2 oil into a lesser toxic NICO oil, which is the best alternative on the, on the market, which is still toxic, but uh, less toxic than the mobile jet 2 oil or the, the, the regular one. So this NICO oil is the newest oil on the market. And of course, because it's an alternative, uh, it will cost more money. So that's the second uh, goal that uh, I envision for my company. And uh, the third goal is that my company invests in bleed air filters, which, which are not yet on the market, but are in a testing phase. However, I think I believe in innovation and companies could invest in clean air and could use this even as a marketing campaign. So the bleed air filters will be on the market uh, end of this year. Of course, I understand that this is still in development and end of this year, uh, the beginning of next year, these filters should be on the uh, open market. The next goal is that companies will invest in detection systems. For example, you, you have also in, in, in our homes, we have this CO2, um, how you say it, um, detectors. Detection, detectors. But we can also, if the combustion is not, not very well, we could also experience something like a CO2 intoxication. And also there are a detection system that can can detect uh, all kind of chemical uh, substances so that's also something one of my goals that this be installed in our aircraft so from the moment that these toxic chemicals are detected that we have to land so the the exposure is lessened into the minimum and then uh, the last goal is the recognition of aerotoxic as an occupational disease and that that's going to be the, the the toughest one the toughest goal there's also something i think as an individual uh, purser there's not much i can do about that except for raising uh, the awareness campaign and and knock on the door of uh, my management and also uh, politicians uh, that they would advise that they're that they will organize like an independent anonymous multidisciplinary research on the effects of yeah well flying onto the body and if it if it's done by an, an independent research uh, medical uh, professors or doctors uh, not related to aviation we make a very good chance that that this occupational disease could be recognized sooner or later but then that's something we we need politics to make this as a mandatory step into the process so these are my goals <laughs> i know they're like difficult to achieve but you know uh, if everyone believes in the same uh, vision i believe change is possible True, true. That's very true, Rose. So uh, my next question is, um, now you've done a lot for the community, a lot within your company. What is uh, What are the reactions of your colleagues towards you? How has their reaction towards you changed in the last couple of years that you've begun fighting for aerotoxic syndrome? Uh, well, in the beginning, people actually didn't really believe 
they were like, mm, well, it, it couldn't be that bad. But then uh, when I was informing people, like yeah, there's a fume event on that aircraft, a fume event on this aircraft, people started to come towards me informing me like i have this i have that all physical uh, uh symptoms and slowly actually not that slowly because uh, i've been doing this for one and a half years so that's kind of a quick uh, pace that we we have people started to believe this like okay i smell this wet sock i smell wet dog i have chemical uh smells on board i have these symptoms and the more i informed the more people came towards me and asked questions and i really appreciated what i was doing and uh, but the management of course they don't really appreciate that that action uh, but now, after one and a half years, one of the uh, managers came to me and his husband is flying for another company. And he told me, you know, my husband experienced a kind of an, a severe fume event and he's ill. He has been ill for one month and he's still experiencing problems. And then that was actually a shift for me. That was I never, I never wished somebody of the management to be affected by it, but it was like somebody of the management is affected and really starts to believe that there is a problem. And if on that level, I think on that level, quicker changes could uh, be the result of that. So in the beginning, it was like, what is this woman talking about? <laughs> and now uh, I really, <laughs> I really respect it. And people are coming for, for information and so on. And even the pilots are really respecting what I do. And they voted for me to be in, at the, to be in an international board of uh, cabin air quality organized by a big airline company. And they voted that I would uh, join in their name in that board. So I received a lot of appreciation and respect. And they really uh, believe in the that it's necessary to do something. Because uh, in our company, a lot of fume events are occurring for the moment. And people are really affected. And now they have actually a name for what they are experiencing. Because... Mm. Like in the beginning, when you experience a few more smell events, these symptoms seem like a flu-like kind of illness. Well, illness, yes. It, it's very difficult to, to describe what you're feeling. But if now the people are aware, like, okay, tingling fingers, headaches, thro uh, my throat, I'm coughing, uh, uh, burning eyes, my skin, uh, everybody experience is different, of course. But now the signals are known and now people really understand the urge of what I'm doing. So they're, I'm, I'm really supported for the moment, yes. And that's a great that's, feeling. That's amazing. And what about the management side? Have they begun to soften towards, you know, your approach of helping the community? Or could they do something more to improve uh, the situation? Could they give more help towards the crew? What do you think? Yes, I, I think they need to improve a lot. So in the beginning, it was kind of hostile. That, that's the way I experienced it. And uh, they are softening, but still, they are still working. It's not against, uh, but the information is not really uh, given 100% in an honest way. Um, and they made an information video where they're really urging on the fact that there's no cause and effect that fume events don't cause uh, long-term physical problems which i was kind of uh, i was disappointed in a way and also like okay i i need to still do some work but they are taking the problem much more seriously than before uh, because they can't ignore it anymore because i'm informing and i i'm using social media the internal social media and i'm informing the people so the people are also speaking up for themselves so that's good and so the management had to follow but they are not doing enough i think i think they could they could invest in this oil they could invest also in a medical uh, protocol. So for the moment, they are not willing to do a, a full uh, toxicological uh, blood screening. They just are doing the normal blood screening. And we all know in, in if you have done some research, they won't find anything in, in a normal blood screening. But Because if you don't search for the mouse, but you search for, uh, let's say, for a bunny, you will find the bunny and not the mouse. 
I think there's a bit of ignorance here as well. Well, actually, Griselda, I think they don't want to find because I also understand the economical point of view because if they find if they will search for the proof and they will find it for sure, they are afraid of the, the lawsuits and everything. So aviation is holding this in a, it's some kind of a cover up like the asbestos back mm. then. And uh, so they if you know that there is a problem, would you invest in medical screening that where you could find proof? Of course not. Mm. Um, so Rose, the next question I'd like to ask you is, what advice would you give crew members or passengers or flight crew regarding aerotoxic syndrome? First of all, inform yourself as much as you can, especially if you are on board and you experience a fume events, what the signals are, because if you know the signals, you can immediately report it to your purser or to the captain and ask that uh, they land immediately because uh, the, the lesser exposure, the better, of course. And also for passengers, the next one is just be always prepared and have a mask. There are some masks on the market that you can wear that will protect you. Not 100%, but any protection is better than non, no protection at all. And then if you are uh, exposed to uh, a fume event, report, uh, especially for crews, report, report, report. Because all reports that are done within a company, they have to also be, they are redirected to the the federal aviation and then because the problem was why they don't recognize this problem is that they say well we don't have any reports there there are no fume events at all so reporting is a very important tool to get this open and out and to have uh, the EASA or any organization investigate this on a deeper level so and then uh, if you experience problems inform your doctor about aerotoxic syndrome and and search for a doctor who wants to help you uh, to clear this out. So these are the, the three tips I want to give. I'm not a doctor, so I can't uh, give any medical advice. But the tips what I give is, is already a good first step to do. That's great. Uh, what about uh, how have you healed? Where are you in your recovery process? And are there alternate ways of healing or getting better with the uh, aerotoxic syndrome? Well, where am I now? I still have some tingling in my fingers and headaches. I still experience them. Uh, how have I healed? I haven't healed completely yet. I think the only way to heal is to stop flying and to stop the exposure to toxic fumes. But then I, what I said also before, I use a lot of supplements and I adapted uh, my food a lot because I had a lot of toxic inhalation of these fumes so I don't want to expose my body uh, even more by food that is uh, for example not organic or so I used uh, the ketogenic diet also to improve my health and using a lot of supplements infusions with my doctor uh, that's what I've done and take care of my body and I know I should stop flying I know <laughs> but I couldn't set myself yet to do that so uh, that's one of my probably my next steps. And how do you see the future? Is in my ideal future, I see, of course, that that aviation takes charge of the problem and recognizes that solutions have to be designed. In my ideal future, I hope that they stop using a bleed air and they stop using uh, the system or the same systems as the APU, its uh, uh, power unit, and they, they will use less toxic oils. And for the so they will actually redesign the aircrafts in such a way that the clean that we have clean air on board so that's my ideal future however how do i see it in a realistic way uh, because that ideal future is going to take a long time uh, because aircrafts they they fly for 20 to 30 years at least so in on the long term i hope they redesign the aircraft but on the short term I hope that all companies will protect their crew and invest in solutions, like I told you already, like detection system, bleed air filters, less toxic oils, and that they will give crew support, medical support, and the tools to protect themselves. So that's my hopes for, for the near future, actually. Yes. 
I do think, and I do believe, that the cover-up can't, it will explode one day or the other. And it won't take more than 10 years or five years, I think. It's really now with your program and all the internet and the social media and the, and the television, it is the, the awareness amongst passengers is also growing. So there will be like a shift, a tipping point where we call the critical mass will know and then it will explode and then solutions will be found. And I believe that. True, true. You know, recently I was talking to a radiologist and um, I was explaining to him about aerotoxic syndrome and he told me like, you know, you have a point and that's true. Uh, but I think for crew members or passengers that fly off and they should consider the radiation that their body and their skin is exposed to. What mm. are your thoughts on that? Is that a problem as well? Because I know when I started flying or even in my uh, 20 years as a safety instructor, we were never told about the ill effects of radiation or aerotoxic syndrome mm -hmm, you know we true. always they, they've glamorized our job to such an extent that uh, you see flying as just benefits and you know that's it but there's so many other deeper problems so what is your take on radiation and how do you see the future on that wow well on radiation we all know that our amounts of uh, our hours are counted and especially for people who are flying long haul and full time so that if they they reach a certain amount of hours they have to be grounded but that's still a high amount of flight hours and yeah the radiation is something i heard about from the first day i i started flying but i never realized the effects on the on the human body and as we all all know if you've worked in aviation long enough a lot of people have cancer or even having problems with um, the fertility. Re fertility reproductive system and so on so there are problems uh, seen uh, amongst crew members and how do i see the future actually that's something i never did some research on that topic i don't know if there are technical solutions for that you could say well uh, use lead <laughs> but uh, I think no. the, <laughs> the aircraft couldn't fly <laughs> when it is covered in lead. I don't know what uh, the solution could be on that side of the problem. But taking that into account and the aerotoxic syndrome, we can only say like in my country, you have to work until 67, which is for a normal job already quite a long time but for a flying job they should reduce the amount of years that you have to work because it's really uh, on top of that we have also a lot of stress and we must also say we have a wonderful job but it's also a stressful job stressful on the body due to the irregular hours so taking in to account and radiation and the aerotoxic syndrome and irregular hours uh, and the stress, you could say we have some kind of a job, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we just say it as it is. <laughs> yes, you must really love this job to, to be doing this for years, for many years, because people start often and after a year or even six months, they say, oh no, this is nothing. So the people who are flying long term, they are these people really are proud to be a cabin crew member and they really love the job. It's like it's like a virus that that takes you and that will never leave your body, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's why we are having this talk now, just to create knowledge so that, yeah, they love the job, but they need to be aware of the risks involved for their future, you know. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yes. And I'm very grateful that you give this platform to do so. Oh, that's my pleasure. You know, anything that we can give back because we still have so many friends flying and like you, you're still flying as well. So it's important to create this awareness. So yeah, that's good. At least we create, create that information. We create that momentum and mm -hmm. have a positive outlook on the future. So things change for the community. Mm -hmm. I hope so too. So Rose, do you have any more information that you'd like to share? Well, uh, I heard that you have uh, different people on the on the podcast, so uh, there are many uh, websites that uh, people can visit to inform themselves. I have a, a Facebook group, which is a crew for non-toxic healthy cabin air, and they can join. So uh, it's a group where uh, everybody uh, is informed about all the fume events, but also what they can do and the information for the blood screening is, uh, is on that uh, page. So if they people are interested, they can uh, make themselves a member. And what information uh, can I share? Please help us to spread the news and please help us uh, to bring awareness in the world so things can change. That's my hope. Great. 
Yeah, nice message. And uh, on a last note, then, how can our listeners contact you? Well, as I said, they can uh, make themselves a member of uh, my Facebook group. And mm -hmm. uh, from there, they can contact me easily. Okay, good. That's great. So, uh, Rose, it was lovely having you on the show. Very informative again. I learned <laughs> a lot. I hope you had a great time too. I had a great time, Griselda. And thank you for offering this platform and uh, helping the word uh, to spread out. No, it's my pleasure. So I hope to have you back on the show because yes. I'd like you to come on and speak a bit about self-help because I know you're very active in another sphere as well where you actually have a kind of a, a wellness uh, practice going on. So I'd like mm -hmm. uh, my listeners to also know something about that, about positivity okay. and how to increase it in our lives. So if you have the time and if you would like to, I'd like to invite you already on uh, one of my next few shows as a guest speaker again. I would be honored. So thank you. Have a lovely evening, Rose. Yes, thank you, Brazil. Take care and happy flying. Yes, thank you. And uh, hear you next time then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Rose. Bye. Thank you for joining the three pillars. See you next week. Mm -hmm.